on Board Gamers and welcome back to Not Board Gaming. I'm your host, I'm Mark, and today I am going to be covering a game that is absolutely huge in scope, in ambition, and it delivers on more or less every count. I am going to be talking about Silver Coin, Age of Monster Hunters, which as you can see from, <laughs> there we go, that's better if I show you that side of the box, is a, uh, it's a huge sprawling adventure game with resource management. You're going to be hunting down monsters and fighting monsters. It's full RPG experience. You choose a character and level up those characters and each of these characters are distinctly different and unique, taking place over the continent of Etosia. Uh, and it's this huge continent which almost spans the Earth. Uh, and it's been in peace for many, many years. And what's happened is various dark things have started to happen on this continent. And you were going to go out there and eat, seek out these creatures that start to come. And you're going to hunt them down and make sure you've got enough strength and enough knowledge to hunt them down. I, you know, I, I can't really explain more than that because it is so huge in scope. Now, I first came across this game in Essen last year at 2020 when I went and I had a demo uh, on the stand there. And it is one to five players uh, and the kind of multiplayer game is a competitive game. But there is there are a solo and cooperative scenarios as well. I'm going to be talking about the solo scenario or one of the solo scenarios today. And yeah, I first came across this at Essen. I played the multiplayer game and I was utterly wowed by it uh, from a publisher I'd never heard of before. Um, uh, and it's a game that's been in development a long, long time. And it's big. I mean, it takes up, I've got a big table here and it takes up almost the expanse of the table to get everything on. And that's purely for the solo game as well. So I think if you play multiplayers, you're going to have to find other ways of, of, of kind of, uh, of fitting everything on the table. But everything has its place and everything is, uh, is deservedly worth while and where it is. Now, I do want to issue a bit of an apology. Uh, the, the publishers uh, were very kind to send me through a preview copy a couple of weeks before I went on holiday. Uh, my aim was to actually uh, record this video before I went on holiday uh, in the middle of July because um, the Kickstarter launched on the 19th of July. Unfortunately, I didn't get it done and we're now kind of in the first week of August or second week of August and the campaign is practically finished right now. But do not fret, I'm sure they will have late pledges. It's been very successfully funded. I think it's got over half a million pounds or uh, half a million dollars basically funded so backers are going to be getting this game and undeservedly so so i do apologize for the lateness of this of, of this video but i do want to talk about the solo experience and exactly kind of what you do in silver coin age of monster hunters so as i said this game is big in table real estate and it is big in scope and it's unapologetically big as well. You see, the aim of the game uh, competitively is to kind of traverse through the land, try and rack up as much many kind of experience points and as much uh, experience as you can, leveling up your character, learning new spells, etc., to try and get as much as possible. In the solo game, you have very specific scenarios. So there are numerous solo and cooperative scenarios. The one that we uh, that I've got set up on the table at the moment is called Olm Infestation. Um, and whereas in the main game, in the multiplayer game, your character cannot die, one of the losing conditions here for the solo game is that your character can actually die and lose you the scenario. And it comes with a wealth of characters. So in the, in the preview version, I have six characters here. And you can see the different cards that we have. So we have a chronomancer, we have a shapeshifter, we have a rider, a fighter, a seeker, and natural chaos. And all of them have their own unique abilities. And I say kind of the aim of the game is to fight monsters. Now in this scenario, this kind of this training scenario, if you like, Ulm infestation, we're purely going to fight against the Ulm. And I have to defeat so many Ulm, depending on the level of difficulty that I choose. But how many monsters are there in the game for you to fight? <laughs> well, there's about an inch and a half's worth of monsters. There you go, you can see. There are lots of monsters. You have grey monsters and red monsters, depending on their uh, their kind of um, uh, their threat level. And you know, the red monsters, we have the Manticore, the Griffin, the Basmu, uh, the uh, Atosian Dragon. Let me show you this one, because it's one that's on the front of the box itself, and you can see that there. Um, so you have lots and lots of different monsters in the game to fight, and that gives a great level of, obviously, variability when you're playing the game. 
And in the solo game, what the aim of the game is, is to kind of traverse across and try and defeat these tokens that are here, which is the Ulm infestation. They're going to come out in various mission cards that happen in the game. Uh, and what happens is you will unveil those missions that will then make that mission active. And you've got to try and defeat those monsters before they move off the board because the mission deck in the solo game very much acts as a timer. One of the losing conditions that you have in the solo game is that if you cannot draw any more mission cards, that's it, that's game over. So there's a real time pressure element for it. And let me tell you, this isn't easy. You're gonna to have to make some kind of difficult decisions during the game to try and ensure that you are uh, maximizing your time and your input in the game to try and achieve as much as possible. And you do have to, as I say, uh, depending on the level that you choose, you have to defeat so many of these monsters. And also depending on the level that you choose, whether it's easy, normal or hard, um, that will affect the number of mission cards that you've got in the deck. And I'll talk about those in a bit. So I mentioned obviously the number of characters and the number of monsters that you've got. What else do you get? Well, of course, each character can have their own kind of um, their own decks here and what they can hurt or what they can learn. So my character is going to start with some protection magic, which is going to come in very, very useful. And that allows me to block damage only one time per battle. Uh, and I have to use two of my, um, uh, my magic flow for that. And I'll explain what magic flow is in a bit. But you can also learn spirit magic. You can also learn fire magic. Uh, you can learn protection magic uh, and you can learn air magic as well. And the more of this that you learn, then the better you're better equipped your character is because certain monsters will react to certain types of magic. It's a dice based combat system and your character is going to start with two white dice and explain how combat works as we go through. But there's also the option to get some of these colored dice as well as you go along and that depends on various cards that you get or maybe your uh, your abilities that you've got because you're going to have these kind of uh, these cards here which you'll be able to bid for but effectively buy in a solo game during the game and they, they can give you access to certain dice. So for example, this Chakram, here we go. If I've got that card and I roll a six, the monster loses one health automatically. And I can also gain uh, gain two, two magic flow when it's activated as well. You have to exhaust it after use. So these colored die then help you try and combat those monsters. And as I say, it's a bit of a race against time. You're gonna take a number of actions during that, during uh, each round. Uh, and that is generally gonna be two unless you wanna pay for a third action. And again, I'll explain that how that works. Uh, and those actions will allow you to move around the map. They'll allow you to take local actions, either visit kind of the townsfolk or the capital. Uh, maybe uh, you wanna go on a ship. There's certain ways to go on ships and traverse some of the waterways around here as well. Um, and uh, you can also buy horses, you can buy potions. You can do all sorts of stuff with your actions, but you're limited, as I say, mainly to two. Uh, occasionally, you're gonna have to spend something, uh, spend some XP to get to three action, to get to your third, or to use your third action. Uh, and there's also, as well, um, the ability to uh, get more experience cubes, which are these, get more physical flow cubes, which are these red cubes, and more magic flow cubes, which are these here. And you get to spend them as you go throughout the game. There are also some kind of bonus actions you can take uh, as well, and you'll be able to take those at certain points if you can do them. But the aim of the game is going to be moving around the map, trying to build up the experience on your character, trying to build up your knowledge on your character. You see, each monster that you fight has a knowledge requirement on it up there. And let's start this all infestation. They have one knowledge. So as long as I've got one knowledge, I can fight them without any, any kind of banes toward me. However, if I don't have one knowledge, and again, we'll talk about knowledge and reputation as we, as we move across. Uh, if I don't have one knowledge, then what's going to happen is, is that I would then effectively, that creature's uh, uh, defense, if you like, would increase by one or my attack would lessen by one. So your uh, defense or your attack lessens by the difference of how much knowledge you've got and how much, uh, what the knowledge requirement of each creature is. And again, we'll come to combat in a wee while. So it feels like I'm going over a lot here. And when you first get the game, it feels like there's a lot in a lot in here. But as you start to play, it makes more and more and more sense. So what I'll do is I'll show you an overview of the board, the big board, uh, what things are. Uh, I've set it up for this first scenario. Then we'll go around a round of the first scenario. I'll show you how it plays. Then we'll come back. I'll discuss my thoughts on Silver Coin, Age of Monster, Monster Hunters. <laughs>
So when I said the game was big, I really, really wasn't kidding. As you can see, I've got a fairly big table and I've got, I've had to set the map out sideways for me on my table. It really is utterly bloody huge. And that's okay because as I say, it's a game that feels like a grand adventure when you're playing it. So I really don't mind the uh, the size of it. So here's the main map and you can see Atosia. Now I set it up with various things on there. I've got some old infestation tokens, which are inactive at the moment. Uh, I've got some, um, uh, some kind of uh, people or some, not well, monarchs, that's right, some monarchs that are in the three of the areas. Now, for this particular scenario, I'm only going to be using these three areas here, the red, the green and the yellow. Uh, other scenarios will use other areas and as uh, on the main game, you've got the entire map ahead of you as well. So that's the map. Down here, you've got your reputation board. You're going to be building reputation as you move along. Uh, here, as I mentioned, is where you've got your kind of special action cards. So these are the ones that you're going to bid for when it's a bidding round. Effectively, you're just going to take one of those cards, but it uses an action point. Down here, you've got the dice, the dice that you can use. You're going to draft those dice for the game. At the top, you have the monarchs and the various townsfolk. So I have uh, three monarchs here. I've got the taxer. Uh, which is a 20% tax here, so I have to pay 20% to move into, sorry, 20 coins to move into the yellow area. Uh, in the red area up here, I've got the Unforgiving, and this is a ban token here. And what this Unforgiving card says is that if I return the mission card from this kingdom or lose a fight with its monster, I can no longer take missions from this kingdom, which is crazy. So if I return a mission card from there or I lose a mission in that particular kingdom, I can no longer take any mission cards from there, which makes the game very difficult. And here in the green one, uh, I've got the Skeptic. And you can see here I pay 10 coins less for complete... Oh, so it plays... 10 coins less for completed coins from that uh, from um uh for missions uh from there i've also got a horse merchant in the green which allows me to buy a horse for minus 50 horses allow you to have additional movement uh we've got a monster hunter here in red and we've got the plague doctor here in the yellow area and there i've placed the plague doctor token and it says where he is located there is a plague any player that enters the kingdom has to draw a plague token oh so these these poison tokens and you do not want one of these basically uh, and I'm, i probably will end up getting some of these throughout the game uh, because there's certain things going to happen that generate them there so that's kind of the the board set up for the solo uh, game as i say now over here we've got some herbs you get to kind of buy herbs from various from a couple of places in each kingdom um and what you have to do is get the herbs and you kind of close off that one herb place you have to go to the other to then visit it to get more herbs and they're going to give you boons with that magic flow physical flow uh maybe a strength potion or antidote and you're going to need antidotes for this particular scenario as well uh, so those are along there we've got those cards there um over here is my player board so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to show you my player board now. so we can see my player board here and all the player boards are identical it's just the card that's different i've chosen natural chaos and you can see it starts with one two three four five six health now um the preparation phase if i was to spend any kingdom cards i'll talk about them in a wee while uh, if I spend any of those, I get physical flow. If I spend any of those, I get magic flow. I've got some special abilities. Normally, this action would allow me to uh, swap one uh, physical or magical flow for for the other, for one of the others. This allows me to uh, spend. Let me get this right here. One physical flow into two magical flows. If I use that action, I also pay a maximum of one physical flow for the use of any of these blue cards that you saw, and I can uh, travel to any portal to play one to travel. Uh, uh, and at the start, at the end of an action phase, once per flow round, create one portal at a distance of five max five spaces. Can only be placed at capital cities or the, the, that particular uh, icon there. And I pay one physical flow for a portal, so I can I can lay portals down. And I say each of those cards would go on there. I start with Protection Magic, which is this one here. And here are my three kind of action discs. Okay, so the first two I can use at any point. The final one, I have to spend, uh, I think it's XP to use that final one. So it may be something I don't want to do. It's either XP or Physical Flow. I'll, come to, I'll confirm that in a bit. I also start with an Antidote po uh, Potion, which is going to be good for the poison. And here you can see my knowledge. And this is where my knowledge builds up. So I've talked about kind of... Um, uh, the knowledge and what you need to combat these monsters. So if you looked at this Olm here, he's got a knowledge of one. I've currently got a knowledge of zero, so I would need to build up some knowledge to at least get one kingdom knowledge on there, which would then allow me to battle him without losing anything. Uh, and you would move that up, and as you complete rows, you get these items here, and as you complete columns, you get these items down at the bottom there. And that's kind of the basics of the player board just there. 
what you can see to the left here are the kingdom cards and they're going to get refreshed every round and i get the opportunity to potentially take one or two of these cards as long as i don't exceed my maximum hand size which starts at three and they do various things for exact example if i spend that card it will give me a reputation spend that i can get three movements from that so you can move by either spending your kingdom cards which means that you don't incur any kind of penalties you don't have to pay any physical flow or anything like that for it or you can move as one of your actions on the board so those are the two cards that are in the market at the moment they're going to get refreshed every round anyway they're quite valuable as you're playing the game you're going to start wanting to spend those uh, they help you kind of get knowledge and various things if you spend them in the correct kingdom so for example if i spend that one there i would get some kingdom knowledge for the yellow one but i would have to spend it in the yellow kingdom to do that that's the uh the kingdom cards i say they will start to make sense as we play the game i want to talk about kind of the event phase uh and also the missions now so here you can see the kind of the turn track calendar if you like and it's also triggers what event cards you draw so we're going to start off up here at March, basically, which is going to be springtime. So spring of the green cards. As we move down into June and July, we go into summer. Uh, then we go to September, which is the autumn or fall cards. And then we go into December through to February, which is the winter cards. And that's how this tracker works going down there. And what happens is every time you've done it or you've uh, completed a round, you can move that marker on, flip over an event card, or maybe keep on the same one, because some of them are trackers on there that have multiple, multiple things to do. Uh, and then when you move to the next area uh, down here, as you can see, you move from green in, from May to June, you move from spring into summer, you would then move on to the next event deck. It's kind of a handy way of doing it. That I really kind of like that. It really starts to mix things up because you're never going to go through all of the cards that are available. So let's talk about the mission cards now. So up at the top up here is uh, where we're going to put the mission cards. And these are the mission cards. Now, I've pre-built the deck based on the instructions for the solo scenarios. And, and I don't, you know, it tells you, obviously, only use certain ones from within this area, within three maps that I'm, I'm doing, and that's what's built in there. But there are also nine kind of own cards as well, nine own mission cards. Uh, they've been mixed into there. I found out where they go on the board. They've been mixed into there, and they're going to come out. And if those own mission cards come out on this particular scenario, uh, so if that's where there's already one of these uh, these own infestation tokens, it's going to activate it. But if you pull out a mission card that isn't for an own infestation, I'm going to put a poison token on there. And if I had to travel through the road of where that poison token is, I pick up one of these poisons here. There we go, a poison token. There we go, one of those. And what that means is um, I then get poisoned and I have to try and cure that because it's got definite disbenefits for me. So that's kind of the overview on everything there. There are there's a market deck as well uh, with various potions and things, but we may come on to that as well. There's coins. That's it, let's go into a flow of the game. Okay, so that's kind of a rundown of what most things on the board do. Uh, I've not covered everything because you know, not in any, any amount of great detail as well. It'll take me quite, quite a lot of time. It's a very good rule book online. You go on the Kickstarter page, you've got access to the rule book. You'll be able to have a look at that. Now, as with all kind of uh, previews, this is a prototype. So these are not the finished components or final components. So things are subject to change as well as is the rule book subject for updating also. So, you know, uh, bear that in mind. And also bear in mind that, you know, I may make a, a couple of rules errors, but I'm okay with that uh, generally. That's absolutely fine. Now, so we're talking about solo game. We've got the all infestation. Everything is, is set up and it's going to take place, excuse me, over a number of rounds until I either beat it or the loose scenarios come in. I die, I run out of mission cards, etc. Uh, and there are five phases in the game, in the solo game. In the main game, it starts off with like an auction phase. Obviously, in a solo game, there's no auction phase. So we're going to start off with a mission phase, which is going to be going up there and uh, to that top board and unveiling a new mission. And bear in mind that mission deck acts as a timer. I've still got to set that up for the beginning of the game. There's, I need to draw three cards out and put stuff on the board, but I'll do that in a second. Then there's an event phase, and that's these cards that I showed you went next to uh, next to the calendar. And they trigger certain events, which will actually be a one-off, or they could be lasting for the entire game, or maybe a round, etc. We'll not know until we flip those cards over. Uh, then there's the preparation phase, and this is where the kingdom cards over here. I either draw uh, kingdom cards into my hand, so I can pick two kingdom cards, they will get refreshed. I can play kingdom cards from my hand, or I can swap one out on there, basically, if I wanted to. Uh, and then we've got the action phase, which is kind of the meat and potatoes of the game, where I get to use my actions. And I say there are two actions, and then I also mentioned there's a third action, a bonus action as well. I think I said you've got to spend experience cubes for that. You don't. It's physical flow that you have to spend for that to take that third action. And sometimes that third action comes in really useful. 
Then you move into the cleanup phase, and then you start all over again, and you try and, I say, kind of beef up your character until you can get to the position where you are in a position to fight and defeat those monsters. So, what we'll do is we'll just finish the setup, and I'll show you how the mission cards work uh, for the setup, and then we'll start off with the round of the game. So first, before we start, and I, I draw those first missions out, I'm going to place my character, and here we go. Here's my um, green for natural chaos here. Now, I get to choose any of the kind of capital cities on any of these areas here, and I think I'm going to go for green. Why am I going for green? Because there's a horse trader there. There's a horse merchant. I can buy a horse. And normally a horse is going to cost you 110 silver, and that is it. My exact starting money, I've got 110. But because there's a horse uh, merchant there, that means I can buy it for 50. So I'm going to start there because a horse gives me two additional movement on top of what I normally already get, which is five movement. So I've now got seven movement, if you like, unless there are some particular conditions that stop that happening. So that's where I'm going to start. And then we're going to go up to this deck, uh, up to the mission deck here. We're going to draw out the first three missions, okay? Uh, and these are going to be placed, these are going to tell me where I'm either going to place a poison token, if it's not an Ulm infestation, or uh, make an Ulm active. So let's look at the first one. First one is in, uh, in the yellow one, it's in Akkad. So that goes there. I don't think Akkad has a, an Ulm infestation. Where is Akkad? Akkad is, oh, it's there, I've already placed one there. There we go, so there's Akkad. Next one is Medea in red. So there we go, so we'll put that on red up there. There we go. Uh, and I know, I think Medea has an Ulm infestation. Yep, we've got that up there already. So Medea is there. And then finally, it is Mantigern in red, which I believe is up there, doesn't have an Ulm infestation. So that will have a poison token there on Mantigern. That means if I visit any of those, I'm going to pick up a poison token. Now, over on the mission board, you can see red already has kind of... Um, uh, two mission cards on there. Um, you're only allowed a maximum of three on there. If you add any more, then the one at the end gets knocked off and they all get shoved to the left. Why does that matter? Because <laughs> certainly if I don't get to that monster in Medea pretty quickly, that mission is in danger of moving and I lose the ability to kind of uh, to get that. And if I lose so many within this first scenario of those, then I lose the scenario depending on the difficulty that you choose. So this acts as a timer, but it also kind of put some priority on what you're going to do. So that's kind of the setup finished. I've chosen my starting space. We've got those three there. Let's uh, do, the, do the first phase. And the first phase is to draw another mission card. So first part we do here, here we go. And it's going to Begonia, all right? So that's green. That's good. That's a good card for me because there's nothing in green. Don't think Begonia has a, um, uh, has a, uh, an Ulm on there. Uh, I've just got to find it. No, I don't think it does. So we've got down there, that's uh, Luria. So I've just got to find Begonia. This is the only problem when you're playing the game like me is actually finding these places. There we go, Begonia up there. So we've added the poison token on there. The so now we get to choose an event card from down here. We're in the spring. So there we go. We'll take the first event card. And what do we have here? We have, uh, it's a choice, it's an event, choose A or B. It's clear weather, doesn't affect my movement, certain uh, weather will affect your movement by one or two. Uh, it's also a, a bidding round, that means I'll, be able, I'll have the ability as one of my actions to take one of the blue cards down there. And here we go, uh, choose A or B. It says, immediately choose one coloured die of your choice from any die area and add it to your player area. You're unable to use movement action this turn, or B, rest. When using a movement action, you move half less around this turn and gain one physical flow. Okay, so that's my choice there. That's the active one. That's just going to go there. Now, if I look down at the cards down here, it's a bidding round, and I get to choose one of these cards. And I quite like the look of this Chakram here, uh, because that will reduce the monster's health. And these monsters, these all monsters, are particularly low. So, if we move over to... Let's just get over to the... Um, uh, to where the dice are, over here, I get to choose a die of my choice. So I'm going to choose a blue die. You always roll your white die in battle, but I've got a blue die now because I'm going to aim to pick that chakram up. And that is that event done. So I'm going to move on the event tracker now to the next day, uh, the next phase. So now we move on to the preparation phase. And in the preparation phase, I can either um, 
uh, take two or draft two of these cards or I, I can play cards that are in my hand. I don't have any in my hand at the moment, so obviously I'm going to be taking two of those cards. And seeing as we're not in the Purple Kingdom, I don't really want that, although it does give me a uh, some reputation there, but that will give me Kingdom Knowledge because it's got that experience um, uh, sign on there. If the green one is, and that will give me a reputation anyway. So we're going to take these two cards to my hand and I can hope to play... The uh, the green card uh, in one of the green capital city is a location action, uh, and then I can hope to pay the um, uh, the yellow card and get some uh, reputation from that. So that's what I've got. They've gone into my hand just there. That goes into the discard pile, and we draw out three new cards for uh, ready for the next round. Okay, one, two, three. Oops, that's a <laughs> that's one of those cards. There we go. Three. Okay. So they're the three kingdom cards for the next round. So that is, we've gone through the mission phase, we've gone through the event phase, uh, and we've gone through the preparation phase. We're now in the action phase. And here we have the cards available just here. And we've got Chakram and the Helmet of Liss. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of my action cubes, place it above that, and I now have the Chakram. Remember, I've already got the blue die, and that means I can add it into battle with me there. So that's one of my actions done. I have one action left, maybe two left, depending on whether I use my bonus action. Remember, I've got to use physical flow for that. Okay, so the next thing I potentially want to do is then take a location action. So you can see one of my die markers is gone. We're going to take a location action because I want to buy that horse. Why? Because I'm in the area that's got the horse trader. So what we'll do is I've got the horse merchant here. And here's the card for this. I'm in the capital city as a location action. That means I can buy a horse for 50, which adds two onto my movement. So that's exactly what we'll do. We'll give it 50 coins. 10, 20... 30, 40, 50, and we'll take a horse card. And there, all of a sudden, if you look at that, it should only be 110. I got it for 50. I can now add two onto my movement actions there. Now I do have a third action I could take if I wanted to take a third action, but I can't move. Uh, I can't take another location action and the bidding action is done. I could swap out some of the cards there. I could change uh, bear in mind I can change a physical flow for two magic flow, but I've only got one of each. So I'm going to end this particular round on just using my two actions. Okay, so now we're in the kind of the cleanup phase. Uh, so I bought, I bid for one of those cards, that action just goes back, place a new one there. It's at this point that I should have replaced these Kingdom cards, but I did that a little bit earlier as well. My three action discs are back where they need to be. I am ready to go for the next round. And as I mentioned, uh, the next round is going to start back up on the mission round, on the mission board. So we get the mission cards and we draw the top mission off there. And it says it's Fresia, which is down here, which I know has an Ulm infestation. Okay, so green's starting to fill up, but good for me, there's an Ulm next to me. So that's really, really good. I can move towards this Ulm now and try to, um, <laughs> try to uh, defeat the monster from there. So that's a mission phase done. We're gonna move over onto the event phase now. We're still in green, we're on April. So we'll take the next event card. It's not a bidding round, uh, but look at this, my movement, it's rain, it's minus one movement. And this is an event. Draw one more mission card and put it uh, on top of your discard pile. Add one special action card onto the third position of your special action track and place one special action card marker on the card uh, and one on the location written on the mission card you have drawn. Once you stop at the location, uh, with a secret action card mark, again that card immediately. Oh, so that's good then, basically, yeah. So what I'm going to do is draw a mission card, and that is going to go in my discard pile, and that's going to be Gilgamesh over on yellow. I'm going to draw this, and that's the black ring that's going to be available there. Um, I'm the special mission tokens, here we go. Put that on there, put that on Gilgamesh, which I believe, which I believe Gilgamesh is, I've seen Gilgamesh, 
uh, 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 there we go, is there. So if I get to Gilgamesh, I get to have that card instantly. That's kind of a nice event there on that. So that's the event phase done. Now we're going to move into the, um, uh, into the preparation phase. So I can either play cards or I can, um, uh, I can, um, yeah, I can play cards or I can take cards from, from the, from the deck. Well, actually <laughs> I'm here which is the capital city for green. And I can play this green experience card. So if I play that card, what that actually does, it doesn't give me experience in terms of my blue cube, but it gains me knowledge, basically. It gains me kingdom knowledge, which is really, really, really useful. Uh, I've left the kingdom knowledge tokens in the bag, but effectively, let's just use one of these, uh, these knowledge tokens. I'll show you what happens. So here we can see my board. I've got uh, my knowledge here. Now, if you remember, to tackle the Ulm, I need a knowledge of one not to be hit with kind of a minus one on my attacks. This now gives me knowledge of one. I'm going to use one of these tokens. There are specific tokens for each kingdom. Uh, I left it in the bag, but that gives me that on there. What that means now is I'm now in a good position. I won't lose anything if I battle that Ulm. So that's my preparation phase done. I spent a card and I've got that. Could have, if I had more cards, more green cards, I could have spent those and got the symbols off them, but that's fine. That's just, uh, that's kind of uh, where I got to with that. So my hand of cards is one, but I do have required knowledge. That now. comes down to my action phase, and this works out quite well for me. The first thing I'm going to do is travel. Now I can travel up to six. I've got five as my base. I've got an additional two because I've got a horse, but it's minus one because it's rain on the event, which only means I then travel uh six spaces however i don't need to i just need to travel one to get here to where fresia where the ulm is so there i am i'm at fresia i've got an ulm this is really 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 good because now i can do my location action which is the second one and i can battle that ulm and i can show you how combat works okay i moved i use my location action and now we're going to battle an ulm and i'll show you how the ulm works so it says up here that I need knowledge of one for the Ulm. Remember, I use my Kingdom card to gain some knowledge, so I'm okay there. But also, if it damages me, I'm going to get poisoned as well, so I'll pick up a poison token. If I defeat it, I get 70 coins, one reputation and one experience point. However, it gets additional, basically, here. So we look here, I have to beat its kind of attack of six, it's got two health. Uh, it will get an additional health, if you like, so that becomes seven. If it's in storms, if it's rain, sorry, if it's the snow, a lightning or a storm itself well it's not if we remember from this event card it's only rain here which just affects my travel rain is grayed out on there so it doesn't get an increase there so i still have to beat it by uh i have to beat six on my die rolls if it's near water it gets one all the old are near water so it's definitely definitely near water if I have fire magic, I reduce it by one, it effectively increases my roll by one, but I don't have fire magic. So there we go. I have to roll seven or more with two dice to uh, uh, inflict damage onto this arm. So what do I have then? Well, I don't have any strength tokens, but what I do have is I have my two white die and my chakram. Here we go. Now, uh, I can re-roll if I want to. If I spend, I think it's an XP cube, I can do a re-roll. But I'm going to try and not re-roll here, and we'll see if we can beat this on. So we're going to roll all three dice and see. Here we go. So that's good. My chakram doesn't, uh, doesn't go in because, unfortunately, I need a six to activate that. Uh, but I do have a uh, nine there. Remember, I need to get seven or more. That's got six plus one. Uh, so I need to get seven or more, so that's a damage to the Ulm, so that's one damage there. We're one roll away from, from defeating the Ulm. There we go, excellent. So, <laughs> my Chakram is activated, which the monster loses one, and I also gain two physical flow when activated as well, so I could do that. It's automatically lost its one. I've defeated the Ulm, but I would have defeated it anyway on my roll. That's been exhausted for this battle, but that's okay. We now, or I had to spend, I actually have to spend a physical flow to use uh, to use that. So I spend a physical flow and get two back. So that gives me that there. So I've spent that, that's been exhausted, but that's fine, that's been used. I have defeated the Ulm, and that's how that works. So we can take that token. I can keep that token as proof that I've defeated an Ulm and towards my objective. But now I get to have a look at the rewards I get from here. So first off, I'm going to get 70 coins. Yay, that's good. 70 coins. So uh, I shall get those out of the bag in a bit. Let's do 
100 minus 30, here we go. So we change that over. 110 minus 30, so that's all right. So there we go. I've now got coins there as well. So that's the first thing, I've got some coins. The next thing is I get to get one reputation up on the tracks. So this is track here. So I start here on the zero, we got to one reputation now, which is good. As I pass all these points, I get kind of the bonuses that are under there as well. Uh, and I also get one blue cube for experience as well. So there we go. I've got a blue XP cube. I didn't need to reroll anything at all. And I still have an action left if I wanted to take an action as well. So I'll put the arm back because I've got the token now to say that I defeated it. I've got the treasure from it. Uh, I defeated it fair and square there. Uh, so that's the combat done. Do I want to take a third action? Well, I'll take my move. Oh, I could have actually used a combo action of doing a move and a um, uh, a move and uh, a location action at the same time. So let's say I did that. That's fine. Okay. Um, no, we'll not. We'll not. I don't have any more actions to take. I could have used. There is a combo action on there on the board which allows you to take a move and a location action at the same time. I didn't do that. But there we go, that is the round done there. So I defeated the monster for that particular mission. And that's really, really good. So the mission card is now complete there. That's done, I'm on my way, but I need to build up a lot more to try and get around this map in enough time to complete all those missions and avoid all these poison tokens that are around here. This is very exciting. And there we go. That's just a couple of rounds of Silver Coin, Age of Monster Hunter, only one of the scenarios as well. That's the Orm Infestation. Now there are going to be myriad scenarios that come out with the game. Lots of different ways to play the game as a solo gamer and cooperative as well, which of course you can play co-op as a solo game. You can play two characters, but it plays very, very, very bloody good and very excitingly as just one player. You can see, didn't really move around the map that much and still managed to gain some experience, managed to gain a special action card, managed to fight and defeat a monster and get towards my objectives, but my mission board is starting to fill up. And as I say, those missions act as a timer. As you, The faster you go through those, then unfortunately, the quicker the game goes for you. So you've got to try and maximize your turns on a round. On that final round, I could have used a combo action, which is a move and location action. Uh, didn't use that, I used a move and a separate location action, but had I used that, I would have still had at least one turn left and I could have then spent a physical cube, physical flow cube for another round as well. Never even got to speak about the herbs that you can get, so you can move the herb markets. Uh, I never moved and bought potions or anything like that. I just went and kind of wanted to defeat that monster. <sighs> what are my thoughts on Silver Coin Age of Monster Hunters? I think it's huge i think it's pretty bloody big there is so much potential here for this game i really like what it what it's done i think it's one of the best kind of rpg style board games that i've played if i was to try and find something similar i, I don't know if i can there are some similarities to something like dungeon degenerates here but less with, with, with less kind of narrative than that you're kind of it's almost sandboxy what you're doing here um, I really like the leveling up aspect. I really like the uh, the fact that you can learn spells and they will aid you as the, as the game gets on. I like the fact you've got these monarchs and these townsfolk and the monarchs can be real buggers to you at certain times as well. Every game you play is going to be decidedly different and offer a very, very different challenge. And it's not easy and there are difficulty modifiers in there as well. So if you do find it becoming easy, you reduce the size of the mission deck, which means bloody hell, you've really got to try and race through everything. And as you've seen, those missions can wipe off the board and really kind of keep the pace going for you. And that's just in this one scenario. There are lots of other scenarios as well for a solo gamer. So I played a couple of rounds at Essen with multiplayers. That was very exciting as well as you usurping each other on the kind of, um, uh, uh, on the auction phase and the bidding phases, etc. I've played maybe three or four times now as a solo gamer. Still haven't managed to beat this scenario. I'm generally playing on either normal or hard difficulty. Um, so this was on easy difficulty, so I had a slightly 
larger mission deck. Um, but yeah, uh, and, and I've yet to beat it and I'm having fun and a different journey every time. It's great playing around with all the asymmetrical characters and just understanding how different characters affect how you play your game and what their abilities can do, how they can move, how they can teleport, how they can do certain things. And it's just utterly fantastic. And I think obviously because it's funded and it's funded very well, loads of stretch goals being opened now as well. So it'd be great to see what the final version is like, just how much game has been put into this box. It's really impressive. And I say my only uh, apology to you guys is that I didn't get this video out in time for the Kickstarter launch and we're coming out at the back end of the launch. But fear not, I can dare say there will be late pledges on this. And if there are late pledges, the idea of a really good RPG style adventure game on this huge map absolutely appeals to you with kind of divergent gameplays, with divergent styles, loads of scenarios. Um, with lots of different ways to play and different encounters every time, then you're really going to want to get your hands on Monster on Silver Coin Age of Monster Hunters. It's got that big game feel about it, and from a, a relatively unknown publisher, I think it's an utter utter masterpiece. I think it's utterly fantastic and worthy of your time if you're looking for this style of game. I think my only gripe is the amount of table real estate it takes up. It takes up a lot of space as a solo gamer. This is a lot of space. As a multiplayer gamer, it's going to take up even more space. You'll find creative ways of, of putting stuff on the board, but, you know, it kind of needs it. Maybe the idea might have been better to have some kind of modular map. So, you know, if you're only playing with three, three kingdoms, then at least you're only building those three kingdoms up. However, minor gripe aside, if you've got the table real estate, if you like the idea of a big and expansive game that offers so much depth, so much playability, so much unknown... The dice-based combat is really good because it is mitigable depending on the cards that you get and the dice that you're rolling there and, you know, you kinda, your bonuses stack up and the monster's bonuses stack up and you're off-trading those against each other. That becomes really exciting. Making sure you've got the right knowledge in place to fight the monsters is also really exciting as well because you want to make sure that you are putting yourself in the best position before you start battling some of these monsters. It's fantastic. I've really enjoyed my time with this and I really hope that you go and check out the Kickstarter and hope, look out for a late pledge for Silver Coin Age of Monster Hunters. Please go and check it out. So thank you very much for joining me on this journey through Silver Coin Age of Monster Hunters. My name's Mark. This is Not Board Gaming. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Check out our other videos. And one final thought. If you can't find anyone else to play with, there's nothing wrong with playing with yourselves. Until next time, bye-bye. Oh, 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 oh,